So uh, here's, here's North America uh, about 1.8, 1.7 billion years ago. And again, this southern margin here would run right about through Wyoming. And these series of island arcs, very similar to the island arcs we have today in the Pacific Ocean, uh, particularly north of Australia, uh, that uh, are actually colliding with Australia, and literally as I speak here. And so as these collide, they add new terrain or new landscape to, this, in this case, the southern part of North America. And this is how all continents grow. Uh, and they're still growing today. Australia is going to uh, grow by quite a bit as it uh, engulfs some of these arcs that are just to the north of it uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Pacific. So each time one of these terrains or arcs collides, it typically creates a, a, a compression of the crust and, and mountain building. Basically what mountain building is, to sum it up very simply, mountain building is simply over thickened earth crust, continental crust. And the crust is, is thick and so part of it sticks up in, in the form we call the mountain. So every time these terrains come in and collide, uh, they add crust and they add mountains at the, at the edge of the continent. This is a close-up, uh, and there you can see the southern Wyoming border, uh, what was the southern margin of North America, uh, approximately 1.7, or 70, oh, let's, let's stick with a million, 1,700 MA mega annum millions of years ago. Okay, that's a geologist shorthand one, so I'll use that, use this uh, uh, throughout the talk. So these various terrains were uh, colliding with, uh, again, what, was, what, what would have been Wyoming back then, still is Wyoming, and uh, we're added on to the southern part of the continent uh, bit by bit. And I should indicate that most of the rocks uh, of the Vishnu schist, uh, we know by their, their chemistry and their mineralogy, the minerals that make them up, that they formed at a depth of about 12 to 15 miles down in the crust of the earth. So because of that, they were subjected to heat and pressure, and therefore they were metamorphosed. Well, of course, the question becomes now, well, gee, they're at the surface today, or near the surface today, or at least in the, in the Grand Canyon there at the surface. How did this happen? Well, obviously, when mountains go up, eventually they have to come down. And so the tops of the mountains were worn off, and through a series of uplifts and erosions and so forth, eventually the rocks made it to, to very near the surface. And after this occurred, and we're going to, I'm going to say that perhaps about 300 million years passed while these mountains were being eroded, um, we had a fairly uh, a rolling but low-lying landscape. And at this time, the North American continent began to subside. And by the way, uh, those of you that, are, that, that know quite a bit about Grand Canyon, uh, I'm kind of skipping the story of the Grand Canyon supergroup here, uh, simply for the reason that it's pretty hard to explain in just a few words. Uh, there are some older sedimentary rocks in the Grand Canyon that are older than the Cambrian rocks I'm about to talk, to, uh, talk about, but um, I'm going to leave those for, for, for another time. We do cover them in the, in the book. So here we are in a place called Blacktail Canyon in the bottom, in the bowels of Grand Canyon here, and we can actually see the Vishnu schist, that, uh, the top of which has been planed off by erosion and is overlain by the oldest of these, this thick stack of sedimentary rocks the Cambrian to Pete Sandstone. And there you can see the range of age for the, for the Cambrian period. By the way, uh, those of you that aren't real familiar with geology, I'm all tangled up here. Um, most of these terms, Cambrian and so forth, um, uh, almost all of them are European. You'll recognize two American terms here in a little bit, but the rest of them are, are European, uh, and they were named where these rocks were first studied by geologists, in most cases about 200 years ago. And the Cambrian, Cambria is the Roman name for, the Roman soldier's name for, for Wales. So that's where that, that term comes from. So anyway, here's the Cambrian rocks, layer after layer after layer, that were deposited on this once mighty but now eroded mountain range of the Vishnu Schist. And of course, as Wayne pointed out, this could not have happened if the landscape wasn't subsiding. Now you can also argue, well, couldn't sea level go up and cover the continent? Well, yes, that can happen too. But it turns out that although the, the sea level rises and falls, uh, it's, we still need subsidence in the Earth's crust to preserve thick packages of sedimentary rock. So keep in mind, if, if you don't have the accommodation space, you can't preserve 
the sediments and hence the sedimentary rocks. So this is what the Cambrian period looked like from a, from a global view. North America was on its side, the arrow points to the Colorado Plateau region, and uh, there was a period of, of separating of a once mighty supercontinent that happens to be called Rodinia, and this continent broke apart, and North America was, was isolated from all the other continents for a while, and uh, it, relative to its present geography, it lay on its side relative <laughs> To the equator, and the equator would run uh, at this period of time. The equator was coming up just about like 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 so. And it's across this continent that a series of, of seas came in and transgressed or crossed uh, North America. And I've already talked about the the sea coming into the Grand Canyon region, and uh, the the first deposit is at the Beach Sandstone. Well, let me do a, a, a quick little illustration as to how the sea did this. So we're going to pretend that here's, here's the continent of North America laying bare and being eroded over hundreds of millions of years. And here I am on the shoreline out here in Southern California or Southern Nevada. And uh, uh, the land is slowly sinking uh, and possibly sea levels going up a little bit too. And so what's going to happen, and it, it, sort of the old school geology would say, okay, the sea came in and moved across the landscape, left its deposits, I'm the shoreline, offshore is behind me, and we call this a transgression. Well, we now know from looking at these rocks in, in more detail that, that that's much too simple of an explanation. And really what happened is, okay, I'm still going to be the shoreline here, and the shore is going to come in, and it's going to stagnate a little bit and maybe withdraw a little bit as sea level changes. It's going to come back in, stagnate, and so forth. So sort of two steps forward, one step back. And before I fall flat on my face here, I think you get the point now. I'm going uh, <laughs> to uh, slow down here a little bit. So anyway, uh, basically that's what, what happened. In fact, I tell my, my, uh, my students in my classes that basically to, to get across the state of Arizona, this uh, Cambrian Sea took something like 30 million years in a series of steps in and out, in and out. Um, and we'll see a jump. I, I, I'm obviously not going to show you all these steps, but we'll see a jump uh, maybe two or three million years after, after this screen and five million years later. And we'll see then what happens when the sea moves in a little bit further. And we can actually document these shorelines in the stratigraphic record. In other words, I, I didn't just draw these lines to, to look pretty. They actually are documented shorelines, documented by trilobites that are found in the rocks that help us uh, correlate and date these rocks and, and so forth. So basically, this is the great Cambrian transgression that covered up much of, uh, much of Arizona. Um, there were still some places in eastern Arizona and much of northwest and west central New Mexico that was not covered by the Cambrian Seas. Then uh, we're missing some rocks in Grand Canyon. We're missing Ordovician and Silurian uh, age rocks that uh, are found just west off the Colorado Plateau. They're found in, uh, in uh, western Utah and in southern Nevada. In fact, just, just outside the city limits of Las Vegas, you can find these rocks. But they were probably at one time deposited on the Colorado Plateau and likely removed. So we jumped to the Devonian, named after uh, Devonshire, England. Um, and you may recognize this shot near Jerome here, um, another shot along the, the Verde, from the Verde uh, Canyon Railroad, and another shot here in, uh, in Grand Canyon, where we see Devonian rocks deposited in a very clear, limey, shallow sea, uh, looking something uh, uh, fairly close to, to what we see here on the map. There was an island in the eastern Grand Canyon region, and again, parts of New Mexico and southern Colorado uh, did not receive deposits of, of this age. These seas were very clear, very very shallow, very warm. The equator ran oh, through here, just off, just off the map a little bit. The equator ran through something like that. And uh, we know this with the fossils in the rocks. The fossils are corals and animals like this, and we know that corals, at least the kind of corals that we find in these rocks, needed warm, shallow conditions because uh, they need sunlight uh, in order to live, 
and uh, the water must have been very, very clear, shallow, and warm. Most of these corals need fairly warm water as well. Then on top,